everyone. I think we can begin. Thank you very much for your patience. I'm Anne-Marie Slaughter. I'm the president and CEO of New America. And welcome to a very different kind of Davos event. Uh, in the first place, it looks like a panel, but it's not a panel. It's a conversation. And it's a conversation uh, that is a conversation on reshaping politics. What are the forces that are reshaping politics and civic engagement? It's a global conversation that's part of shaping Davos, which the Davos Global Shapers have launched, that connects 40 cities uh, discussing 10 topics all around the world, and we're going to be talking to our hubs. So this is a conversation, and we are all participants. We have our physical participants here on the panel, and I'm gonna ask everyone to introduce themselves on the panel, not all of you, but please do when you speak. So there's, we're, we're gonna be part of the conversation, you're going to be part of the conversation. Then we have four long distance physical participants, right, uh, in Manila uh, and Tunis uh, and Ottawa. Uh, it, so we're gonna have the, the um, Madrid, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to live out, leave out Madrid. Madrid is smiling at me, uh, so, and Madrid. And then we have the virtual world. Uh, so Jorge Soto is going to represent uh, the tweets, social media, other questions. So this is a, you could say a three ring circus, but I prefer to say a, a lively physical and virtual conversation. So with that, I'm gonna actually ask each hub just to introduce themselves. Uh, and this round, we're just gonna go around and say who we are. I'm gonna ask the panel to introduce themselves and Jorge to stand up. Uh, and then the, the hubs will start talking about what they're doing and we will respond and I will moderate the conversation. So uh, Ottawa, please go ahead. Great to be here, happy to join you. My name is Evan Solomon. I'm the host of a daily political program called Power and Politics on CBC. And our hub had to deal with engaging citizens and Canada's role in the future of governance, open government and engaged citizens. We got a lot of new strategies and new ideas to talk about and I'm looking forward to that. Great. Madrid. Hello, very nice to meet you. Uh, virtually. Um, greetings from Madrid. Let me tell you that we have had a passionate and very interesting debate during three days here in Madrid, and we are very much looking forward to share with you some of our conclusions. Wonderful. Tunis. Hi, uh, Alia Mahmoud, a Global Shaper from the Tunis Hub. I'm the Corporate Citizenship Manager at Microsoft here in Tunis. I'm really excited to be with you guys today. Uh, we had a very, very interesting Shaping Politics panel here in Tunis and really looking forward to sharing with you some of our uh, discussions, conclusions, results. Wonderful. Manila. Good evening from Manila. Uh, happy to join this conversation. Uh, in Manila, we tried to tackle the issue of transparency and participation, especially when it comes to youth engagement. Wonderful, thank you. And let me turn to my panelists. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Danny Sriskandrader. I'm Secretary General of an organization called Civicus, which is a global civil society alliance. We've got members in 145 countries, but I live and work out of our headquarters in Johannesburg, South Africa. Great. I'm Joe Nye. I'm uh, now a professor at the Kennedy School at Harvard, formerly uh, dean there, and before that, at various times, worked in uh, various parts of the U.S. government, defense, and State Department, uh, so forth. I'm Moises Naim. I'm a distinguished fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, a think tank in Washington. Jorge. Um, Four months ago, I was the uh, general director of civic innovation at the president's office in Mexico. Wonderful. All right, so Manila, I'm gonna start with you. If you will just give us the highlights uh, of your uh, uh, meet, convening. Uh, and then again, we will respond and I, I would invite you to raise your hands as well. Okay, briefly, uh, what we tried to tackle here in Manila is the issue of uh, participation of the youth. We have here what we call the Sanguni Kabataan, which is actually the youth participating in a local council in, in local governance. Uh, unfortunately, the, this uh, youth council mirrored the same problems of corruption that their adult peers in, in that uh, uh, local council uh, experience. And so um, it is actually in crisis because of that corruption issue. And what we try to do is to see how we can set that reset button in order that this really becomes a transformative and, and solution uh, solution-based uh, youth council. 
And so what we did was have a hackathon and uh, the solution that was uh, presented to us and is called Tandem, which is a project gamification. And in turn, what it does really is, is provide an engagement platform for young people to be more engaged in the youth council. Through a game. Um, what it does is, um, it's, it's a project gamification. So what it does is the young people in a particular community will register through SMS. And then uh, that then becomes a dual communication system for both the youth local uh, council and uh, community members uh, that are part of the, uh, the youth. And uh, so solutions can be talked about, problems can be communicated, solutions can be communicated. And it also gathers data about uh -huh. who participates and so the uh, policies will then be shaped according to uh, the data that was collected. I can imagine politicians using it to build their lists uh, very, very cleverly. Reactions? <laughs> well, corruption is a, is a tremendous problem. And uh, the question of, or, uh, of how you deal with it is often transparency. And the question I would have is, is asked for the Manila group is, did you ask about how um, information technology can do something about increasing transparency? I mean, you have the name and shame capacity, but also there, there's, a, uh, I believe in India, there was a plan where if a, uh, if a civil servant asks you for a bribe, there's a way in which you can tweet, or if not tweet, at least indicate uh, through a virtual communication that you've been asked for a bribe, and it can be anonymous. You don't have to... I paid a bribe. You know, yeah, you don't, yeah, but you don't have to jeopardize yourself doing it. But it does create some degree of disincentive. So, I, you know, we ought to be trying to think of ways about how you can increase this transparency, increase the, the disincentives. I wondered if your group talked about that at all. Uh, definitely. I think that is a very uh, active discussion and also not just active discussion, but creative solutions coming from young people when it comes to using technology and transparency. I myself work with uh, Transparency International and the kinds of innovation that we're seeing in terms of uh, monitoring, reporting, using uh, the digital platform has been impressive. And I think what we're seeing is a new kind of active citizenship that is really pushing the boundaries of transparency and accountability amongst young people uh, and really calling out um, if should there be any uh, corruption practices um, that can be exposed um, in government. Danny. I was a, a bit disappointed to hear that you've experienced this challenge with corruption because I think for me we're at a... Um, there's a little bit of uncertainty here about whether the ways that young people are organizing and mobilizing will be less prone to the sorts of corruption that older sorts of institutions yeah. did. I mean, I think my generation, when we organized, we'd form a committee, probably register an organization, elect someone a chair, get some funding. And we know those sorts of institutions in practice lead to rent-seeking or, or corruption or, or, um, or status grabbing, whereas I think the sort of more vibrant, spontaneous, less organized um, institutions that are being created that aren't necessarily about monetary flows, I would hope would be less prone to corruption. But I, So it's a bit worrying, though, that we are hearing that uh, in Manila that even these new formations are, are susceptible to the age-old challenges of human frailty, I suppose. I had a very similar reaction. Is there anything from uh, social media? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so um, there's a uh, one question, a couple of questions. One from uh, Laura Gurgel. She says, um, "Well, one percent of the population owns, owns fifty percent of the world's health wealth. Is there a political will and economic mechanism to revert this?" Ah, okay. So I'm going to turn back to Manila. Uh, so I, and this actually ties together with the question of corruption. I mean, there's deep inequality in the Philippines. There's deep inequality in many countries, and that has to be an issue for youth as they engage. I mean, is that in your idea of getting people to be active citizens through a game or bringing them in? Is there? Do you talk about how you address that question? Oh, well. 
Definitely, because uh, it's important to note that we've had some gains in fighting corruption in the Philippines in the last four years. And, and the fact that we're trying to reform the Youth Council and we're trying to make sure that we don't make the same mistakes is a sign of that. But yes, corruption does get in the way of development, and we are experiencing that in the Philippines. Uh, part of the problem is when you have weak institutions um, that can be easily uh, captured. Um, so when you just have a change of leadership and the uh, when you have a change of leadership and there is no talk of good governance, then those weak institutions become prone again. So the idea the idea is really to have innovative solutions in order to make sure that uh, corruption is curbed. And and one way that we're seeing there could be a lot of room for growth and improvement is with young people participating in anti-corruption work through. Uh, something very, uh, something that they're very, very familiar with, since they're mostly uh, native to the uh, digital technology. Moises, in thank you. <coughs> Sorry. In in many countries, the main tool uh, to fight corruption <coughs> is the short-lived, uh, uh, highly visible and short-lived uh, scandal. <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry. When I speak about corruption, I cough. <laughs> Uh, in what you typically see is that there is, a, there is some corruption uh, um, accident or some corruption event that is detected or is denounced by the media. It becomes a big issue and it, it stays as a big issue for uh, a short uh, um, period of time and then it more or less uh, uh, dissipates and one never knows what happens. So my, my suggestion is that as important as denouncing the corruption I, I didn't identify in the culprit is stay on it uh, and make sure that impunity does not become the rule uh, because one of the biggest feeders of corruption is impunity, is uh, the, the, the risk reward relationship of, of being corrupt. If you, if you feel that you can get away with it and there's impunity, then you know, you're creating an atmosphere of, of, of incentives. So be, uh, be careful everywhere from um, fighting corruption with the short-lived, highly visible scandals. So one advantage of I paid a bribe is that you can map the cor corruption, right? It's anonymous, I paid a bribe, but then you put that on a map and you can see clusters at this border, clusters at this office. Uh, so you can't deny the reality of corruption even if you're not uh, pointing fingers at precisely at individual people. So do you want to, uh, do you have a response? And then I'm going to move on to Ottawa. Yes, I, I agree. And, and this this, uh, this project that we did, in fact, fosters collaboration between young people who are members of the community and those sitting in government. And so I think the, the thing of having this long-term engagement um, can be addressed because it does foster uh, a healthy collaboration and really holding uh, those in, in public office accountable in the long, in the long run. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ottawa, you're on. All right, we had a great session last night. I'll do a quick report. And part of it had to do with open government and what that is. That was defined as government that doesn't intimidate its citizens through complexity or through compliance that can act as a collaborative, engaging, transparent force. And on the other side, the problem of voter disengagement, especially for young people, the millennial generation. In the last election, only 38.8% of young people actually ended up wow. voting. So what is the problem? So there's quickly three stages. Um, there was a kind of diagnostic phase. Why don't people, especially young people, get involved in government institutions? There's a good side and a bad side. Uh, on the good side, activism is very high amongst young people, but they're not active necessarily in government. They're active in NGOs and other institutions, but they don't seem to want to vote for various reasons the panel discussed. Some of them actually say, despite the privileged position Canadians have in terms of access to information, income disparities compared to many other countries, young people here actually say they don't have enough information. But that may mask a more profound issue, which is government relevance. Uh, let me just focus quickly on what they talked about on, on disengagement. Well, there was a tactical discussion as to how we can engage uh, young people. But before those tactics work, the, the, the problem has been, one, you don't, we don't teach civics in our classroom, so there's an educational problem. Two, this downward trend has been going on for 40 years, and it 
parallels the fact that there's been a downward uh, or a trend politically to say government doesn't work, a kind of neoconservative philosophy that has been in ascendance in Canada and in other places like the U.S., which has said smaller government is better and government is not the solution to your problem. So there's a generation that's grown up. That's who has Canada? Not I thought that was the United to States. Government as a solution. <laughs> Yeah, it's the, <laughs> it is the United States, uh, and, and so it's part of it. So we talked about using digital technologies, um, open data, big data, to try to re-engage citizens and young people in it. Now, the question is, how do you do it? And this is the Canadian problem. It turns out that Canadians, through our government, we have about what they call 210,000 open data sets. In other words, 40 departments have given people access to government information. But in typical Canadian problem, it's like a natural resource that we, we give people access, but we don't know what to do with it. We rip it and strip it and ship it. But we haven't formulated <laughs> it and used it in a way where people can actually know how to use it to turn it into something which is voter engagement. So we talked a lot about that and the potential problems uh, on how to do it. I'll throw it back to you. That, so uh, I, love the, I love that idea of, of <laughs> 210 open data sets. Uh, it's like the, the issue with the EU when they would talk about transparency and everything was in theory open, but if you had no idea what questions to ask, it didn't help you very much. Reactions from the panel. Um, the disengagement of the youth, actually, the, the fact that they don't go to vote is a problem. But there is another that I think is an even more troubling uh, problem, and it, it, it is their disdain for political parties. If you ask any youth uh, around the world, uh, you know, would you rather join an NGO that is fighting for a remote problem, they will probably be willing to do and do good and, and get involved and engage. Then you ask them, you know, why don't you join a political party in your country? You know, they run for their exits and they would not touch it. So political parties are discredited and very often for very good reasons. They are, they are perceived to be oligarchic, exclusionary, uh, and corrupt and, uh, and old. And, and, you know, it's much more fun to join an NGO and a movement and and a vibrant uh, community of people that trying to achieve. That. But, you know, in order to govern, you need political parties. In order to, to democracies, you cannot have democracies uh, based on movements. You cannot have democracies based on NGOs. Democracies need political parties. I'm not suggesting that they join the corrupt, old, boring political parties that exist, but either get to them and rejuvenate them, re-energize them, reinvent them, or uh, invent a new, new ones. And so, uh, and, and, Jer and I, by the way, this is not just a problem for, for the youth or, or, or people in Canada. This is a global problem in which political parties have uh, lost their appeal to be the national habitat for idealists. So Ali, Ali I'm gonna call on you in a second because I can see that you're nodding in, in response with a smile. So this is an intergenerational challenge here, right? We're talking about the new forces that are shaping global politics and Moises is saying, do whatever you want, all this new technology, all these NGOs, but bottom line is democracy needs parties. Now that's an old force uh, and I, I certainly know lots of people who disagree. I'll, I'll hold my own view, but Alia, do you want to jump in and then I, I'll come back to Evan. I, I was nodding because I, I think it's really interesting um, talking about how democracy is also sort of represents older and old force and older institutions. But here in Tunis, it's a completely new experience. Um, as you know, since the Arab Spring in 2011, we've been um, very carefully navigating a political transition towards a democratic system. And I think while we have, yes, successfully had two rounds of peaceful democratic elections and that we are starting to see a semblance of democratic parties, um, I don't think that the culture or the society has caught up yet. I think it takes a lot more time to change mentalities than it does to change or institute political parties. Um, we held a very interesting panel the other night uh, with two very prominent representatives of civil society, as well as two members of our, our constituent assembly or parliament. And both of them are women from different generations, one of them uh, from the Nahda uh, Democratic Islamist Party, uh, who is one of the youngest deputies, another woman from the Nide Tunis Party, the one who, the party who won the presidential elections, from uh, the, who's from an older generation, and two very active civil society members. And 
one of the things we we were talking about how in this culture of we are now in a democracy and how do we engage youth considering we had a very low turnout of youth despite the fact that we went through a revolution, despite the fact that it was spearheaded by the young generation, when the elections came around, they weren't anywhere to be found. So it's a conundrum for Tunisia, you know, the the first country of the Arab Spring. Where are our youth? Where are the ones who are out in the streets protesting for this right? And it's a, it's a fascinating challenge because uh, why aren't we able to engage them yet? I don't think political parties have figured out the best way to engage them. Um, it's funny that I heard a panelist mention that politics are boring. I think that that is um, quite a, a long-held belief here in, in Tunis, where I don't think youth feel excited about politics. We talk about, we specifically spoke about how the growth in youth activity in civil society has been much more significant than their interest in political parties, and how we're even locally seeing that being a springboard from civil society into politics. Um, so I think we definitely need to come up with more interesting and exciting ways uh, to engage youth. The youth deputy um, on the panel, she mentioned that she doesn't consider herself a young parliamentarian she or a female parliamentarian. She just considers herself a representative um, of her, her population except that she has a Twitter account and probably a lot of the other deputies don't. So she feels like that gets to keep her a little bit closer to her constituents. Um, so that's so just I'm gonna to come back a brief to you. overview. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna come back to you. Evan, I wanna come back to you on the parties question uh, in terms of what, so it's interesting to hear, you know, from Tunis to Ottawa, you've got a very well-established, mature democracy and you've got a brand new one and both of you are reporting very low levels of youth engagement. So, but Evan, I wanted to come back to you in terms of how you think, do, will parties help? I mean, does, is, that, is that part of what you all discussed? Well, we did, not and, and this is the fascinating thing. It's very easy to, to cite examples of apps and technologies, and there's some really good tactical elements where you can engage groups of young people. But again, you know, there's no sense, you know, if you have a patient with diabetes, you got to talk about lifestyle genetics. You got to do a little, you know, again, let's just look at the context young people have grown up in. Uh, again, uh, government doesn't help. There are various institutions, churches, mosques, synagogues, they've atomized, their families have atomized. They are the rise of the individual generation. Our panel spoke about something called slacktorism, where they think being active is, you know, tweeting out a hashtag or something, but how do you cross the threshold from joining Facebook pages and tweeting about things to actually getting involved in institutions? And that has been a real challenge, and I think on two fronts. Um, on the party front, it wasn't technology that the leader from Apathy is Boring said, one, do you know what young people really makes them vote? When they meet a politician face to face. Good old fashioned FaceTime. Here we are on a virtual panel. And the second thing is we have organizations, a, a young guy called Taylor Gunn has run an institution called Civics and Student Vote, where throughout every election they get people who are not yet at voting age to, uh, they have almost half a million people involved to get part in, in, in educations, in classrooms, in virtual participation. Because statistics show if you don't participate in your first two opportunities to vote, you might never vote at all. And that has huge democratic consequences. So the responsibility is first on our education system, but secondly on political parties who need to survive to literally get in front of people face to face uh -huh. and engage them and become relevant. So here we go, we've got a new force shaping politics and it's called knocking on doors, <laughs> uh, going to town yeah. halls, and Bloody meeting knuckles. voters where they are. <laughs> Danny, I'm gonna let you jump in. I mean, obviously you run a civic organization like this. Yeah, well I wanted to come back to Evan's point earlier about openness because um, it actually reminded me of, I had lunch with a Canadian minister recently and it was a fa fabulous lunch in London. And when it came to who was paying the bill, the minister sort of shifted in his sheet, a seat and then looked to the junior official who pulled out his credit card. Turns out there's so much open data coming out of the Canadian government that every, every time a minister eats lunch with someone, 
he or she has to declare it and the bill gets published somewhere in one of those uh, data sources that Evan was talking about. Which minister? About. I want to know. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was a, it was a fabulous <laughs> meal uh, in London. Um, but it, it reminds me that, you know, we've had a quiet revolution when it comes to the amount of public information that governments and public officials have had to release. And it's not just in Canada, it's across the world. We've had Freedom of Information Acts being introduced um, in Kenya, which has been a sort of an African leader. Vast volumes of public information have been published. But the problem, which I think Evan and his group have, uh, have hinted at, is that the demand and the, f and the, the understanding and the, uh, is not there. The supply side is getting much better, and governments, you know, especially through the Open Government Partnership, which now involves 72 countries around the world Absolutely. who've committed to becoming ever more open, uh, it, that's great. But we now urgently need to build a demand side, and that's about trying to understand and navigate this vast amount of information but it's also about, about building the capacity w within all generations uh, to use and understand this data. Because without it, we can't have the accountability. You need the demand and supply. So we, have a, we actually have a German Staatsminister in the office, and I'll give you a little time, but I'd love to hear your reactions uh, to that. You don't have, if you, <laughs> you're, you're free not to, to, if you want to take a second, but I would be interested. I, I want to ask sort of your reactions to the open government movement, and I want to put on the table whether we shouldn't move toward the idea that some information really shouldn't be public. In other words, if what that means is it's stopping ministers from having lunch with people where they need to have lunch, that's not a good thing. You, you don't have to order champagne, though. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but ministers are humans, too. <laughs> Please. Hello, Laura. Um, I was laughing a lot of times during this discussion because, first of all, it's um, I like to engage more young people, and I'm leader of a party in my in my region that's Northern Westphalia in Germany. It's 18 million inhabitants, and I'm leader of the Social Democrats and Prime Minister. So um, I'd like to engage them, Please. but it's not all fun. It's hard work, to be honest. And sometimes I've got the impression they know they, they look at into information and they think information is everything. No, it's value of information. It's working through information, and that's hard, hard work. And um, I don't know if it is a, a dinosaur parties, but I, I know nothing better to be honest. I'm not in a party because I ever wanted to be in a party. I came quite late, so in 1994 I entered the party. And then in 2000, I became parliamentarian. But uh, that was quite late. I was engaged in several other areas, and uh, I became mother, and that was quite more important. But uh, then in the party, I had to learn a lot. I had to learn that information is not everything, and that it is really hard work. There was a new party which came up a few years ago in Germany, the pirates. They mm -hmm. call themselves the pirates. They wanted to do everything in another way. <laughs> and now they're in the parliament. And they are somewhat like a CEO. They're sitting there making just like it's, it's pro or cons. That's not the thing. I mean, they have to create ideas. They have to work on, on parliamentarian papers. And uh, so that's really hard where some of them do, but not all of them. And some of them are really disappointed because they always ask for open government. I mean, we are on the way to open government. That's what we should do. But that's not a solution. It's okay. And I'm honest. I need transparency. But I also need a lot of intransparency. If not, I will not reach the goal I try to reach. For example, we had, uh, on our regional level, we are responsible for education. So one of the crucial points when I became prime minister was uh, I have to, to find a solution not to fight another decade over the structure of schools in my region. So we said uh, we have to talk to each other, even though it's difficult. And we talked across the parties. And we did it without letting nobody know that we talk. If someone should have known that we talk, this would never have been a result. But we finalized the, what we call the freedom of school structure for 20 years. So that was important to do so. And it's not to be transparent 100%, then politics is somewhat, yeah, it's, it's not able to work like it should. So that's, it's, it's hard to define, but my dis decision what I do in transparency and what is intransparent is always my mirror at my home. So, <laughs> hey, <laughs> yes, please. There's a Thank you. That we think that young people are getting less and less interested in politics. Let me point out that in the 2008 election in the United States, 
There was an increase in young people participating. Why? Because they got excited about Obama and about the idea of an African-American president. Now, they did become disillusioned, and one of the problems was it was easier to use social media and information technology for this young generation to get elected, as it was easier for Obama, it's harder to use it for governing. And to keep them involved and engaged, I think, is, is the problem. It's not that they're all apathetic. I mean, look at Coney 2012. You had, what is it, 80, 100 million people all worrying about an African warlord in northern Uganda. I mean, it's not, but, but it, didn't, it didn't have follow through. And, and that's, that, to me, is the problem, is not can you use the new media to engage young people. You can. It's how do you get them to realize if they want to accomplish something, mm -hmm. they've got to stay engaged. That's the problem I think we have to look at. So again, th this all does come back to it's hard work. <laughs> uh, I've got another person fr from the audience, but it occurs to me that maybe what parties should do is reinvent themselves as NGOs uh, created to get things done. And that way, <laughs> people will come together and they'll have a mission. Please. Yes, please. And. Uh, and I promise, um, Yolanda, I'm coming to you sh very shortly. <laughs> we talk about um, citizen engagement, youth engagement, worker engagement. Let me offer a, a theory about why people are disengaged. Uh, Just been, introduce yourself. Uh, I'm sorry. sorry, and I'm Jerry Mikulski. Um, we've been treating them as consumers. In our last election cycle, we were presented, do you want the Romney or the Obama using exactly the same technology as would you like the Cheerios or the Cocoa Puffs? This is not democracy. It doesn't resemble democracy, and everybody knows it. If we treated them as citizens who, are, who might in fact be able to help us solve problems and offered them tools and brought them behind the curtain so that they could actually be our trusted allies in this process, they might actually all show up and vote, but they might do much more than vote. And we need them to do more than vote once every four years for one of two parties that are very close to each other, pretending to be different, that are not changing the agenda. So the problem here is that we've consumerized not just politics, not just consumer goods, not just entertainment, but everything. Okay, um, I'm just looking, yes, for another response there. Yeah, I think one of the issues that Eduardo Cruz from Dominican Republic, one of the issues that we see in Dominican Republic is the, the, a lot of cynicism that is around politics. So it's like everybody on Facebook or on a dinner table or in Twitter or in their universities or at work talks politics. But whenever somebody says, I want to get involved, then even their closest friends say, oh, why do you want to get into politics? What's your interest? What do you want to get out of it? So there's a, there's a perception that if you go into politics, you become a traditional politician like the ones we don't like. So it's like a fence, that is a fence of corruption that forbids people to get into politics. And I think it's a big challenge. So Cleo, I'm going to actually come back to you. To you can can uh, I just that, add one yes, sentence? Please. Because my experience is, they always say, the politicians. And it's negative. But whenever they get to know one of them, they say, oh, he's different, she's different. But they are all different. And that's, that's always true in Congress. Congress has under 10% approval ratings, but people like their member. <laughs> Which is, um, I, I want to make sure we, we get all, a chance for all the hubs to talk about what they've done, and then we'll, we'll continue this conversation. Uh, and, and Cleo, I was saying later, I'm going to come back to you on this question of cynicism, because that's, that's certainly true, uh, I think, in the Philippines. Uh, but um, let, let's hear, uh, Yolanda, let's hear what, what, what you all did in Madrid. Good evening. Um, let me tell you that uh, most of the uh, issues of discussion that you are bringing up in the debate uh, have been covered here also in Spain. We had an in-depth debate on, on the future of democracy um, and we came up with a diagnosis that I think is, is, shared in, in, is being shared in the debate. And this is that the, there is a growing level of, of social unrest um, not only based on the on the economic or, or the consequences of the economic crisis, but but in relation to the political system, that that can be a, a threat to the to the survival um, of uh, democracy. The the significant uh, the terror, deterioration of the of the prestige uh, of uh, political institutions, and 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 here I include not only uh, parliament, political parties, uh, politicians uh, themselves, but also. Um, multilateral organizations or or even uh, uh, corporations or, or, or the bank um, this uh, the, the 
this the lack of legitimacy that we that we feel uh, most of the population in Spain, but I, I, I'm 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 sure that um, it's it's a shared feeling in in, in most of the developed democracies. Um, this um, unrest I, I, I was saying need uh, urgent measures, and there is an element that you haven't mentioned so far, and it's uh, the need uh, in 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 for for reforms. Um, to, to break the cycle of inequality. Inequality has been uh, probably the, the most repeated word in our debates uh, on democracy here in, in Madrid. And, and we've been uh, discussing for three days from different perspectives uh, on, on the issue of, of rethinking politics. So um, I would say that the conclusion or the, or the most shared uh, uh, idea that has been uh, put on, uh, forward here in Madrid is that uh, there is a need uh, for economic uh, and political uh, reforms uh, to envisage this the breaking of the cycle of inequality and also uh, there is a need for institutional reforms in order to assure three major uh, elements or, or three major things and, and th those would be uh, more transparency uh, as, as you have already pointed out uh, more accountability and more participation not not only from uh, young people which is also is indeed uh, very important but from all levels and groups uh, and new actors in in, uh, in society. That, that would be my, my headlines from the moment. Thank you. So you note, and this goes back to your point, that transparency is not the same as accountability. Right? You may have all the information, but if you can't use it properly, you can't hold people accountable. So those two things, they're often mistaken, right? That if government's completely open, well, then it must be accountable, but it's not. So it's interesting that you, you put all, th all three of those. Um, le Alia, let me come back to you because I want to make sure we got all the, the points you wanted to make from your session, uh, and then I'm gonna and then I'm gonna ask you all to, the the hubs to raise their hands as well as people here, and I will direct us uh, according to themes. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I think it's really interesting what the panel was saying about how difficult. Uh, it is to engage youth. It's not as simple as, you know, having a great social media communication campaign. Um, it's it's a lot of work. Um, however, it's also a lot of work on behalf of the youth. Uh, one of the things that came up in our panel um, from the president of a an associate an NGO here called El Bausla, which is a watchdog organization set up after the Tunisian Revolution by youth, um, all of the, the people who work at this organization are under the age of 30. They sit in on every parliamentary meeting and report attendance, and they publish online who was there, who voted on what, which is a huge, huge difference um, for the way that we do politics uh, in Tunisia. Um, she was saying, the, the president, who's also a shaper, Amira Yahyawi, was saying, we have to stop victimizing youth. We've gotten this, this discourse of we have to involve youth more and we have to reach out to them more and we have to get out on their level. Yes, this is all true. However, youth can't just sit back and expect for the political parties to do all of the work by setting quotas, by you know forcing people to get youth involved. These are important measures, especially for a new democracy. But youth also have to learn what it means to be an active citizen if they want to see changes. They need to be active and they need to fight for them. And another really interesting point that came up as well is we shouldn't be talking about a binary situation here. This isn't old versus young. We keep following, falling into this discourse now in the new kind of Tunisian political context of old versus young. As you, as many people may know, our newly elected president is over the age of 85. This is a, a very um, hot topic of can somebody of this age represent the youth who rose up during the revolution? But it's less about this binary old versus young and more about representation. Youth under the age of 30 make up over 50% of the global population. We should be re represented as part of our rights to representation, but we also need to stand up and grab it and merit it and engage. Um, and the last thing, the last point um, I want to make is that we are also, I think it's going to take a lot of time here to learn that political engagement is not just about voting. It's not just a coming out and slipping a piece of paper into a box every time there's an election. And us navigating how can we 
politically be engaged as youth outside of election period. Um, Because right now, our democratic process has been a bit relegated to, okay, we have elections coming up and mobilizing and getting people out there, um, but we need to go above and beyond that. And I think that's going to be the adventure to come for Tunisian youth. Wow. Okay. We've got lots of things on the table. Let me see if I can just... uh cover some of the themes that we've heard and then and then allow us to, to, to uh, continue to discuss some. Uh, and again, I'm going to ask each of the hubs just to raise your hand if you want to make a comment uh, and I because I can see you the way I can see I can see you actually better than I can see the audience. but uh, uh, but so so we've we've heard a, a number of sort of paradoxes. I mean the, the first is uh, the idea that is what's come through very clearly is politics is hard work. That's what parties do. That is, it. traditionally, parties are the way you get organized. There's a lot of horse trading within parties, and then there's a lot of horse trading uh, between parties. That's, je- that's been traditionally how the hard work gets done, and that for a, a generation that has been mobilized much more in terms of movements, uh, the, and you, you, know, you either participate virtually or you get out there and march, but you don't want to do the hard work of actually governing. So we've heard sort of that, that young people don't want to put in the work. On the other hand, this is the generation that, at least in the United States, has a different balance between money and meaning. Right? They're the generation that are focused more on meaning. They're the generation that are founding NGOs, that are going out uh, and, and committing themselves uh, to making a difference in the world. So one, one theme here is what's going on there? I mean, is it just that they want to make a difference, but politics is dirty? I mean, the, or politics, I mean, actually, uh, uh, Jerry said it, it, they feel like they're consumer, they can't participate. I mean, how, surely there's a way to communicate you want to make a difference, you can make a difference, not just by voting, but by doing something specific. Why, well, since you want to say something, then I'll just, call. Just, just briefly, let them, in, in, underlying this conversation, there's a heroic assumption, and that is that age unifies and homogenizes. And so that the, we're talking about our category of discussion here has been the youth. And assuming that just because you are between the ages of 18 and, and 35, you will have a homoge- you know, that you are belong to the same, you have the same views, the same preferences, the same ideology, the same values, and, and that's not true. Uh, the youth are a highly diverse group of people that own, many of them only have in common their age. And so we need to be very careful not to classify them as a unified, homogeneous uh, entity and political player. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna call on Danny, who represents youth, uh, also the the, uh, the hubs. But after Danny, I'm gonna call on Mark Penn, who also actually knows a few things about uh, public attitudes. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Being called a youth has made my day. Um, <laughs> oh God, I, don't tell me you're not a youth. Yeah. If you're not a youth, I'm a grandmother. <laughs> um, I just wanted to come back and say, I mean, every year at Civicus, we, we do a state of civil society re- review. We look at what's going on in civil society. And something peculiar seemed to happen in the last few months or few ye- in the year or so, which is that if you take countries like Turkey, Brazil, Venezuela, on paper functioning democracies with regular you know, elections and all of that sort of stuff uh, on paper, uh, and r- doing reasonably well economically. But what did we see in each of those countries? We saw you know, fairly dramatic mobilizations led by young people who were using social media and other traditional forms of mobilizing uh, to, to take up you know, deeply political issues and, and challenge governments with varying degrees of success. And so I, I'm not a political scientist, but I do wonder whether there's something going on, at least in those countries, because of the ways in which these young people are choosing to mobilize. Um, so perhaps their life experience, their frustration with party politics or whatever else is going on um, is actually you know, leading to a new form or a new way of, of mobilizing. Thank you. Mark. Uh, I thought I'd just give you a couple of observations. Over the years, I've worked in about probably 35 developing democracies. And so they tended to have a certain, you know, there were certain events that t- typically happened, and then I just want to make one quick comment about the, about the youth thing. You know, first of all, democracy doesn't exist without real free will. And so when they used to take polls in the Soviet Union, when there was no free will and said everybody supports everything, they were phony. And the first thing is, where they're shooting people, or where your life, or you could be jailed, there's no real democracy yet. And then I think there's a second level, which is, is it corrupt or is it fair, or is it fair enough? I mean, they, they hauled off the, 
the, what is it, the state senate leader of New York just yesterday. Uh, so corruption happens everywhere, even in the most established democracies. But, it, but is it fair enough? Do you, is corruption such a block that you don't know who's going to win or not? You don't have democracy. Then when you clear those two hurdles, you begin to have democracy. And that first democracy is usually party-oriented, and the parties kind of get their members, and the parties get their people to, to the polls. And the second stage, and this is where I came in through the years, was when elections became communications-based. And when they're communications-based, they're usually more leadership-based. Who's going to be the best yeah. leader for our country? And, you know, I, I think transparency is important, but I think a leadership is ten times more important. Getting an honest leader who can shape and mold the system and finding one, you know, getting politics is a tough profession, you know, you, in any country where you have to stand up, state your views, do what you have to say, you know. And so, <clears throat> and then you move into that, and then after the politics of leadership, usually either it succeeds as a democracy or the politics of leadership, the people in office just, wow, they don't want to give it up. <laughs> Okay, and then what they do is they get rid of the no re-election clauses, like in many of the countries I worked in in Latin America. Then they take over the institutions, and then you're back where you started from. And I've seen that pattern. And so if you get to the politics of good leaders and you get to the politics of improvement, boy, that's the time you really have to watch out, right, so that it doesn't, it doesn't fold over. And that suggests that social media, et cetera, makes that worse because it's all about M maybe communication. Maybe, and then, you know, my comment about about youth is, let's just remember in the United States that when John F. Kennedy was elected, young voters out, outnumbered over 65 voters two to one, right? Today, we are crossing the threshold where over 65 will outnumber, right? <coughs> will outnumber under 29. And so <coughs> the biggest vote in America, America it's, in fact, it's all the same people who voted for Kennedy who are now the over 65s, <laughs> if you think about it. And we still right? think we're young. And I still have it, but, <laughs> but don't forget that there are countries in most of the developed democracies that, ha that you know, this America has never been older than it is now and is going to get a lot older, where you're going to have a lot of people. I mean, the reason why young people were so great in politics is they had time on their hands. You're going to have a lot of older people who now will have civic time on their hands for the first time in history. And they can transform politics as, as much as anyone else. The rest of the people were always too busy with their career and with their families and their kids, and so their political time got limited. And then I just finally, I don't worry, uh, you know, I'm not as cynical about youth. Youth typically took time to get involved. Uh, they, I don't think they're voting much of anything other than I don't have kids, family, or religion yet, and so therefore I'm not sure politics then becomes much more important to people when they get that. And in the U.S. and other places now, they've kicked all that back another five years. So people don't get married until 32. And so all those things may actually be a little bit more delayed, and we may be seeing the effects of that, that we're going to have to mot motivate them a bit more. So, so I, I, I agree. Well, it's got to worry about all the voters. Now, in Tunisia, Tunisia is a young society. The Mideast is young. Under 21, that's all the people. So <laughs> I agree that there are areas where mobilizing youth and getting them involved is so much more important than in areas where, in fact, youth is, is a small and, and declining group. And in, the, in those areas, if you don't get youth, then, then your whole society is, is completely out of touch. Okay, so we've got a number of people still in the hall, and I realize, of course, you poor people back here. I've got to, I'm turning. Uh, but I, I want to make sure anybody from the hubs want to respond, you youth who are yeah. differentiated. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Uh, that, uh, uh, Yolanda, you first, and then Evan. Yeah, uh, I would like to uh, point out that um, to uh, convert uh, mobilization um, into political engagement, whether of uh, young people or not young people, uh, you need to provide them or there is a need for, to, to provide for actual and effective uh, tools of participation, to, to, to make participation uh, real. And for that, um, I think there is a need to, to revisit the way uh, the political agenda is set 
or the decision-making processes uh, that are in place in, in, in our institutions and, and, are also, and also within the, the traditional political parties. Uh, we want people to engage, we want people to, to participate, then we need to give them that possibility, but not the way we think they should participate, but the way they are asking us to be allowed to participate in politics. Thanks. Evan. Uh, two quick points on, on either side, the government side and the, and, and the student side. First, on the student side, someone raised this question that we've been transformed into consumers from citizens, which has been a big part of a dialogue here in Canada. But it's been fascinating where we saw young people really active in, in Canada has been in the province of Quebec. Uh, Quebec youth marched in the streets over tuition for post-secondary. It already has the lowest post-secondary tuition fees in the country, but they have a vision that in Quebec it should be free. There's a lot of resentment in English Canada about that, but in Quebec, young people had a collective citizen's vision of what kind of society they want to live in. And that was interesting to juxtapose the crisis in a lot of democracies, and this is where from Tunisia to Canada we all connect, who can articulate, whether it's through a leader or a political party, a collective vision where citizens have an idea of the society they want, whether that's from the Arab Spring or in the Canadian elections, and then you work backwards how to get there through a political process. We saw that in Quebec, and it activated youth and seniors. Secondly, on the, and, and Anne Marie, you made a great point about accountability and transparency. Canada has, as I said, a lot of, we talk about big open data as if data itself is a solution. It's not. In fact, our information commissioner says that it has never been more difficult for citizens to access information that they want through our access to information laws. Long delays. So while we have the patina of access and there's a lot of information out there, actually getting the information you want and getting the information you need and getting the information the government may not want you to have is actually becoming increasingly difficult and more controlling. So we have to be very careful, as one of our panelists said, we have seen the fruition of the McLuhan world at the same time as the fruition of the Orwellian world. So open data cuts both ways. It can be used for the citizen. It can be used against the citizen for, in all sorts of ways. So we've got to be very careful about using big terms without talking about how they're used, how the data is understood, how it's accessed, how it's used for and against the citizens, and how it's used to articulate and get at the vision of a society that citizens, not consumers, want. Yes, there, that. and Jorge, you, you flag me if there's something. Uh, I, uh, Aaron Kramer from BSR. I think we are implicitly referring to the nation state, and in fact, people identify and affiliate with different entities now, hyper-local, global, civil society, virtual communities, and I think part of this is because the nation state is being squeezed between issues that get handled locally and issues that have to be handled globally, and, and I don't think national politicians have done a particularly good job of, of surmounting that structural change that I think really affects a lot of this. I, I know what they're laughing about. They're laughing about the fact this was a big issue in the 70s. <laughs> I, just noted, I just noted that John and I uh, wrote that in 1973. That's, <laughs> I, it doesn't make right. it not true. It just means <laughs> I, I know the piece. Okay, there were two here in the front row. With, okay. And then some. Uh, I'm uh, Jonas Støre, uh, leader of the Norwegian Labour Party. Ah. <laughs> uh, and I just wanted to make one reflection on uh, methodology. I, in, in, in my experience, the more we do social media, uh, the more inclined we are to say that that is our communication. But my experience is that the more we do that, the more we have to do the traditional campaigning. Hmm. So at every election in Norway, we have, you know, um, celebration of the champion of social media. But, but my view have always been that that championship doesn't really matter unless we have really been able to knock on those doors and have the town hall meetings. And the second observation is that I believe people are still very ready for that kind of meeting. So, you know, the more you make yourself as a politician accessible to schools, universities, young people, or to the workplace, people show up. They take issues seriously. But the challenge back to us is that in this knowledge society and experience-driven society through the knowledge you gain through education or work or hardship, we as politicians have to 
significantly renew the way we shape the policies. Now, here is the old way, and that is to go down the hall and find the guy in the party who knows about railroads. So we make our rail, rail, railroad policy. The new method is that we have to go out much more largely and listen beyond the party, beyond the union, and into where the knowledge and experience is, and really give people uh, the true experience of being involved. And then we are pretty good at making budgets and plans and all the rest of it. But Martin Luther King never said, I have a plan. <laughs> he said, I have a dream. So I think, you know, this leadership thing and, and being able to uh, uh, translate this, you, you need representative democracy and the parties to do it. But they have to be much more open and much more inclusive and much more knocking on doors. And here social media can, can fool us because it can gives the, give the impression as we have as citizens that we are so connected. But, but, but we are really not. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to pass the microphone to uh, the person next to you. But let me just point out, you said two things that, that are two other themes that I want us to, uh, to, come, to come back to. Uh, one raised is the importance of leadership and this ability to articulate a collective vision that actually is not top down, but, but bottom up. But the other, and this was raised before, is are there ways we can actively engage constituents in collaborative problem solving, right? This is what's coming, not just voting, yes, but, but exactly, if it's not just walking down the hall to the expert and getting it, how do you do that? And technology can help, but that's hard work too. I mean, it's still consensus building, and actually, to your point, some of it's better done out of sight. Uh, so, uh, please. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Oth from the Kathmandu Hub, the Global Shapers. Ah, thank you. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, mainly, corruption was mentioned, but I think corruption is a cultural issue. It's a problem of culture. So it happens to affect politics. It happens to affect the private sector also, which wasn't clearly mentioned. So we, as, as youth, we really need to change that culture so that we see that change happening in politics and in business and social life as well. So it's a cultural shift that we need. Thank you. Thank you. Cleo, do you want to come in back in on that? And also, we've lost Madrid. Yeah. I don't know if, if we're trying to get Madrid back. OK, Cleo. Um, just to address some of the, the points that have been raised, uh, the structural issues, the disjoint, the disjoint between local uh, structural realities and global commitments that our leaders have made, and also the new forms of mobilization that we're seeing. It actually links to your earlier question about the cynicism. And, and for us in the Philippines, just to contextualize, there's still a lot of traditional politics. And that means patronage politics. Wow. And in fact, this, this, um, the, the theme for this session, which is rethinking politics, for us, it's really about rethinking solutions. Uh, because uh, just to contextualize, uh, we might have political parties, but they're not programmatic political parties. We may be a, a founding member of the OGP, but we're not yet at that point when too much information is a problem for us. <laughs> uh, we might have good voter turnout, uh, but what is the quality of the elections that we're seeing? It's very expensive for anyone to engage in politics because of very serious campaign finance issues that we have. And so young people have, have this need to rethink solutions and find ways to be engaged. And for sure, it's hard work because there is an online uh, uh, presence that we need to have in order to engage the youth. But there's a lot of offline uh, activities that we need to be engaged in as well. So yes, there is a need for active citizenship on the, on the part of young people. But it's precisely because of very traditional structural issues that we've had to go around in order to be more relevant. Thank you. So in Mark's uh, typology, uh there, there, we, we left out party patronage politics, which certainly American democracy has gone through. So uh, there in the back, and then there was a social media question. Perfect, thanks so much. My name is Blair Glencourse. I run an organization called the Accountability Lab. Ah. We empower young people to build creative tools for accountability around the world. And we've talked a lot about how ineffective government has alienated youth. I wonder if we need to flip that a bit and talk about naming and faming rather than naming and shaming. Huh. Engage youth creatively by showing them where government does work uh, and the champions that are doing good things as it relates to transparency and accountability. Just to give you one very quick example, we just organized uh, a national TV show and movement in Nepal called Integrity Idol. 
uh, where we asked people to nominate honest civil servants from all over the country, got hundreds of nominations, <laughs> filmed them doing their jobs, talking about why it's important to have integrity and serve the public good, uh, and then showed it on national TV. And That's thousands so and thousands of young people voted by SMS and Facebook for their integrity idol. Um, so it can be done. I think maybe it's just a, a question of uh, reframing the way that we, that we think about it. So uh, let me just ask you, uh, and the, what uh, you said tools for accountability so we've been talking about you know tools for onward engagement what just give us a sense of what other tools you're talking about sure i mean by that i mean i think we need to meet youth where they are rather than where we want them to be so that means engaging them through media through culture through art through games um, yeah through games exactly um, so we've set up film schools accountability film schools in different countries uh, in nepal again on this this issue of information uh, we created a wiki tool um, that students have used to crowdsource information on public services, making that information free and transparent for everyone. It's been uh, accessed hundreds of thousands of, of times. So there are different ways of, of doing this, but the tools have to be bottom up. They have to be owned, of course, by the people who are going to use them. Uh, and then we build communities around those to make them sustainable. Huh, great, Corey. Or uh, there are several questions here, on the, so I'll summarize in three. One is uh, whether uh, you know concrete examples of this open data movement uh, tackling corruption. Um, the second one is, where do you prefer uh, youth, at the, at the parties or in the streets? And the last one is, isn't this, this disengagement of the youth speak about the failure of politics uh, to align with citizens' concerns and communication? Great. All right. I, I mean, unless anybody wants... Joe. One, one thing that might help is, is a little historical perspective. If you <laughs> go back 50 years or 100 years and ask how many youth were heavily involved in politics, I suspect it's lower than it is now. So we don't want to have an idealized point. I think Moises made a very important point. Lumping all youth together is a mistake. I mean, a lot of young people, myself at that age, didn't care that much about politics. I was interested in girls. Uh, <laughs> and thank God, I married one and it has been very good. But but I, if you but, had more women in <laughs> politics, that well, could be mixed. I could have uh, combined two. No, but the point is, let's not, let's not uh, romanticize the past. The interesting question is whether young people see paths that go forward. And what strikes me, and I don't see a representative sample of something called youth because there is no such thing, but I'm struck by the number of young people that I come across today who want to give back who either are willing to run for politics, but more than politics, who want to start a nonprofit, who want to work in a, in, for Teach for America, for example, in, in the US after they graduate from college in terms of urban schools. I'm, I think, in fact, the generation of students I see today, which is an elite sample, but nonetheless, is much more public spirited than my generation was. Danny. I just wanted to uh, just reflect on what I think is slightly different, though, in most countries around the world today, because I think we're seeing a confluence of at least three things that are, that are unprecedented in historical terms. In the vast majority of the developing world, we have a youth bulge, so Tunisia is a great example. Um, so we do have very young populations. We've had the ICT revolution, which has put the power of communication, instant, spontaneous, anonymous, if it needs to be, communication into the power of citizens. And third, we've got the data or openness revolution as well. And I think that's the confluence of, of things that means that we, at least in the developing world context, we have to be rethinking the nature of politics. That said, some of the, you know, some of what we've known for thousands of years about what goes on in politics will still be there, and that's, you know, corruption emerges, or or uh, party politics have to, you know, some form of political formation needs to happen to, to formalize or institutionalize those movements. But there is something special going on out there. So we've only got ten more minutes. I'm going to add. I'm just going to add one more thing to that. I think that the divide between digital natives, who are today's youth, and digital immigrants, who are my generation, probably anybody over 40, I don't know where you draw the line, that divide is as great as the 1968 divide between the establishment uh, and, and the youth movements then. It's less visible. I mean, in the United States, you're not walking around you know, with long hair and, and flowers and everything else. But in terms of how you think, in my experience is it's just as great, uh, and they don't they don't dislike us as much. But um, <laughs> uh, so in our remaining time, I'm going to turn back to the hubs at the end and ask them to ask ask a question. Uh, but I I would love to hear more examples if anyone has them of this collaborative problem solving of this sense that 
it's one thing, it's, it may be hard even to get youth to vote, but, they, but they're, that's interconnected because they're not gonna vote if they don't see how that's gonna actually make a difference in their lives and accepting that many young people aren't thinking about you know, child care policies or housing policies, et cetera. Um, but are there examples of how it's beyond the election? And uh, you know, because one of the propositions, Moises just said, that's parties. You're not gonna get away from that. And I wanna hear if anyone has any alternative to that. A deafening silence. Jerry. Exactly. So there's a group called NCDD, the National Dialogue, National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation, ncdd.org. They have a couple 800, 900 experts on group process who've done civic dialogue in three, four dozen different formats from World Cafe to leadership circles to wisdom councils to what have you many of which are face-to-face, -face, some of which are online, all of which are quite useful. And I think it's a matter of picking and choosing and remixing uh, to make them appropriate. But our tools are so blunt and stupid, the ones we use, even here at the forum. We don't use very good group process. Um, so I think a lot would be aided if we did. Great. Other examples or comments? Can I answer? Yes. Uh, can, I, can I just Absolutely. quickly mention one of the questions that was um, in, in by social media was the effectiveness of the street marches, the street activities. I think the question was, where do you want the youth in the streets? And I have been following all of these street movements, and it's quite uh, striking how ineffective they have been. If you look at, uh, you know, you go beyond the Arab Spring and look at all of the marches, you, you mentioned a few of them, you know, it turns out that in this time and age, it's quite easy to put 100,000 people in the streets and then nothing happens. And people feel that victory is to just have 100,000 people or more feeling a big uh, street in a, in, a, in a big city, and um, they have the same grievances, they have the social media that helps them coordinate and mobilize and energize, but then nothing happens. It's this huge political energy uh, that turns at high speeds but is not connected to the wheels. Yeah, and therefore, there is no traction. And I would pose it again that the traction has to be provided by political parties. So in the United States, you had Occupy Wall Street, which was in the street, and you had the Tea Party, and who's had a greater political uh, effect. Yes, please. Hi, hello. My name is Bruno. I'm from, from Spain. I just want to point out, to follow this comment, that in Spain, right now, that is happening. There is a new political party that is coming after all this movement that is happening, and it's based a lot in social media and also in the youth. But uh, I want to point out that the, until the party arrived, the indignados, the movement of the people that were indignant in the streets, it was a cathartic movement. They just protested, they were furious about the, the situation, and nothing happened until they organized. And once they organized and became a political party, they're now the first uh, the force, you know, they're leading the polls uh, in Spain. And th there's an interesting point there, though, it's easier to do that in a parliamentary system, right? In the United States, you know, you, people try to create third parties, but the wisdom is that's not gonna work, so don't bother. So and, and you get even more frustrated because you have all this energy in Occupy or Ferguson, and if the choice when you have your next election is between son of Cocoa Pops and wife of Cheerios, <laughs> And you would think what sort of democracy called, is that? Yeah, and you would think because they're called parties that they would be attractive to youth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a couple last comments, and I'm going to turn back to the hubs. Anyway, well, if anyone else wants to. Just one point, Anne Marie, which is uh, uh, politics isn't the only way in which one can have a public life as a citizen. If you provide opportunities for people to do social service in poor areas, or to go to inner city schools and use their education for poor people who aren't getting opportunities, to me that's a much more important aspect of public citizenship than just voting or than joining a political party. And I think if you ask what are the other things we can do, we can make sure that those opportunities exist. So public service opportunities that actually you find a lot of young people are taking advantage of them, and we shouldn't just focus on the youth wings of political parties or virtual youth wings. We ask, how can you let young people actually go out and give back, do good? And we do have some ways to do that. Great, thank you. Yes, 
please. I'd like to comment on that point because uh, you're right. I came into politics because I, I was working in public areas like you described. And uh, there were a lot of things I were ang was angry about. And that's why I went into politics, to change things. And I, th I still want to change the world. And I always waited for that when I go in there, something severe will happen. Everything I did know about parties was, oh, that's uh, dinosaurs. Um, you have no chance to, to change things. And that was not what happened. I never took a decision I didn't want to take. Never. And I'm 15 years in Parliament. So I, I was fighting for my ideas and for my point of view. But you could change a lot of things if you are in there. And that's my message also to those who are with us. Because it is possible to go into a party and to change things. And to change also the party. And so... In the end, you, you end up as a leader of the party, but <laughs> and that makes even more work. But it's 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 worth going in there and trying to to get the ideas of young people into the party. I mean, we are rolling out the red carpet for them. I, I need young people everywhere, especially in the council of the small cities and towns. We need them, and come in and work, and you can decide on a lot of important things. So that was the message from here to you. I'm going to go back to the hubs and ask each of you, very briefly, uh, to, d to give a message back to the audience here. You can ask a question uh, as, as what would you ask uh, uh, in general, or you can just have a final reflection. So uh, let me start, and let me do it uh, in reverse order. I'm going to start, uh, actually, uh, Ali, I'll start with you and go back and end up with uh, Cleo. Thank you. Yeah, I, I um, appreciate the panel's reflection, especially the gentleman from Civicus, about can we talk about our political system in the same way everywhere when we're talking about youth bulge, especially in the case of Tunisia, and the ICT revolution and this kind of confluence um, of, of our generation, whether you call it digital natives or something else. Um, I think my final reflection is something that came up in our panel that really kind of, I think, links to this discussion of, is the only way to make influence through the political parties that are offered to us? What other options do we have on the table, especially as a country that is coming into the democratic system for the first time? It's like we have this once in, a li once in history opportunity to do democracy differently. But if that's what we want as the youth generation, we need to know what that looks like. So not only how to shape politics in the confines that it's presented to us, but how do we actually go beyond and redefine politics? Great, thank you. Yolanda. Um, I would go for a final reflection and uh, share with you the, the thought of one of our panelists here in Madrid. Uh, she said that the uh, sustainability of democracy depends on the credibility of uh, the political institutions and the political system. And uh, to strengthen that and to and to make it uh, credible and sustainable, um, I think the key uh, elements or the key pillars for progress and reforms are, as I mentioned before, accountability, and these depend mostly of the institutions themselves and participation. And, and again, I, uh, as I said before, participation is about what the groups, the political groups and NGOs and social uh, and the civil society want to do and to say, not what, what the institutions expect them to, to, to say. Great. Thank you. Evan. A great panel, first of all. Um, look, there's a lot of new tools that we've got, and we can talk about that, to engage a fundamental problem. There's cynicism, there's disengagement, there's corruption, there's uh, disparities between the rich and poor, demographic issues, uh, where politicians are serving those who vote, and there are these negative cycles uh, in North America serving the baby boom generation because they vote. I would say of all the solutions that uh, we've seen here and that I've seen, there's a new world set of problems, but there's an old world solution, and that is education. It turns out that it's what they call the trim tab theory of change. If you, It's the old rudder at the front of the boat doesn't turn the ship. In the middle, a lot of effort doesn't turn, but if you put it at the back, you can touch it, and it turns the ship. And 
when you educate citizens and you give them active roles to understand and the tools to understand their connection to their democracy, to their government, if there's transparency and if there's those fundamental factors of a democracy that we spoke about, it turns out, in my view, that education is the, is the connection between the old and the young, and it crosses, and that's where people engage and active to make the change. And, and I, I think the crisis is, are we investing enough in education for the young people uh, so they know that they can participate and turn government from a force on the outside to a collaborative institution that they feel they can participate in? So we, instead of global shapers, we need global kids. We need to go down one <laughs> in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the engagement. So uh, Cleo, last word. Thank you very much uh, for this great conversation. I was able to learn a lot from the conversation, from the insights of, of, of the contributors. Um, and if we are to rethink politics, I think one of the things we have to do is really to give young people uh, an enabling environment. They can be agents of change. And if that means carving out that enabling environment using di the digital technology or social media, that is what young people will do. Um, when you talk of corruption, you don't talk about innovation. Everyone's just asking what, what is the gain for them. Uh, but young people are open to innovation and, and, and they're open in, in fostering collaboration as well. So I'm very hopeful uh, with regard to, to uh, the gains that we will be making in, 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 in the future. Thank you. So let me end with uh, yeah, three very... One thing? I'm sorry, what was that? Can I just say, we didn't say lower voting age. People oh, have sorry. thought about that. We saw that in the Scottish referendum. And maybe changing our political system, in our case, from first past the post to proportional representation. Yep. Those are bigger questions, but they're certainly part of the dialogue. Absolutely. Thank you. So uh, three quick final reflections. I've heard two... Uh, Two, two expressions that I'd never heard before, uh, one in this session and one a little earlier. But one thing I take away from this is that the more we use new tools, the more we also have to rely on old tools. And this is sort of, once you have e-books, you still have a, you know, a growth in regular books. But this feed on the street, which I heard for the first time yesterday, the idea that politics actually should be about feet on the street. That's the oldest form of politics, but the more virtual engagement we have, the more face-to-face -face engagement we need at the same time. That, to me, is an important lesson. The second is I've never heard name and fame. I love it. Uh, we, name and shame is, is part of our lexicon, but the idea that you could actually celebrate public servants of many different kinds uh, in the very same way that we celebrate many you know, singers and actors, I think is, is tremendously important and a, a way of meeting people where they live, but, but also you know, recognizing that a lot of people who work in government don't get paid well and do actually devote their lives to doing, doing something important. Uh, and the last thing I will say is just this point about how can we have ongoing participation in collaborative problem solving. Obama mobilized the youth and everybody else, but then he let that machine go. And when it came to health care, there, no, there was no way to mobilize people. And obviously, you can't mobilize people on very technocratic details, but there are ways, and we've heard some of them, for, let, for continual input and a sense that you're still part of the conversation. I want to thank everybody who participated. This was a complicated exercise. I want to thank the Global Shapers for coming up with Shaping Davos and Shaping Politics, and thanks to all of you. Bye.